Hi everyone, it's James here. Welcome to another video, a very special one. This is going to be something very different. Uh, this is an interview with Kevin Godley. Kevin Godley, formerly of 10CC, Godley and Cream, um, legendary musician and uh, award-winning video maker extraordinaire. So how this came about was a bit of a chain of incidents really. A while ago, I was invited to join an online community of Beatles fans really. We meet we meet every now and then uh, on Zoom to talk about all things Beatles. This was a project started by a guy called Henry Hemming who is a friend of John Heaton, that's how I met Henry, and a lady called Lucy Nolan who is a friend and colleague of Kevin Godley. So this all happened behind the scenes really, I didn't really have anything to do with the setting up of this but um, I ended up being involved in the Zoom chat with Kevin it was an amazing experience. I mean, you know, long-term viewers to my channel will know what a big 10TC fan I am. 10TC was the first rock and pop music, really, I ever heard when I was a child. My parents had a copy of the original soundtrack in the house, and I can remember listening to that or hearing that through the bedroom wall when I was a very small child. That would have been before I'd heard the Beatles, you know. I mean, it really is. It's music that goes way back into the mist of time for me. Um, I've always loved their music. Kevin Godley, just one of the legends of British pop and rock music, but of course he went on to this very long and illustrious career as a video maker and filmmaker, which is ongoing. So the video that I'm going to show uh, on this channel is, is in two parts, and it's a kind of edited highlights version of the, I think it was a two hour conversation that we had with Kevin. There are a few of us asking questions, chatting to him, so I've tried to cut the questions and answers together into a format which is roughly a narrative. It's not quite accurate in terms of chronology, but I've tried my best to do that. So what you'll get in part one, you'll get um, Kevin talking about uh, his pre-10CC days and also the 10CC era. You'll hear him talking a lot about the band and how it came to be and some of the successes they had, some of the near misses they had as well. Kevin is very frank and open about um, what happened with 10CC. They're a band who had a huge following and um, certainly have earned their place in rock history. But it's, uh, it's, a, it's an interesting story. So that's part one. And then uh, in part two, which will be a separate upload, uh, in, that, in that episode, Kevin talks about his post-10CC days. So we get some of the history behind Godly and Cream, the Gizmotron, uh, the Consequences album, all the fabulous video work uh, that Kevin did with the likes of Frankie Goes to Hollywood, uh, working with Trevor Horn, and of course we have quite a large segment where uh, Kevin shares his memories of working with various solo Beatles during, um, during the 80s and 90s when he made promo videos for Paul McCartney and George Harrison and also worked with Ringo as well. So lots of great stories coming up in these two instalments. Um, I do pop up in both episodes. Um, I ask a few questions in episode one. Towards the back end of episode one, you'll find my questions. And then in episode two, my contributions are uh, scattered through the episode as and when. And um, John Heaton, for those of you who know John's channel, he's also on board with the um, Zoom chat because he's one of the Beatles Zoom frequenters as well, one of the members of the group. So I can only thank... Uh, Henry Hemming for organising this, for inviting me in the first place. What an amazing privilege uh, to talk to somebody like Kevin Godley. Not something I ever expected to do. And thanks to Lucy Nolan and um, for her contribution behind the scenes in helping to persuade Kevin to um, to jump on board for this hopefully very illuminating and enjoyable chat. So I'll stop rambling and uh, we'll cut to the chase. I do hope you enjoy these two videos, part one in this instalment and part two to follow very soon. Thanks. Enjoy. I think the music that we were all listening to at the time, music per se, popular music, rock music, had a vastly greater influence on people and the way they thought that, than it does now. It, it actually meant something. Just to kick things off, just a nice easy one. Is there a, a song and an album from those wonderful years with 10CC that you're particularly proud of that you kind of 
treat as your favourite song or, or, or LP? There is, and I keep coming back to it. It's a song called Somewhere in Hollywood, and I think it was off sheet music. I'm particularly proud of that one because it was, it, I think it was the first time that Lola and I had written anything of that scale before. It was quite long and quite involved and quite a detailed song. And it probably came from our desire to make a film at some point in our lives. We were, you know, as you probably know, we were art students. So our, our grounding was, was, was in things visual. And we found ourselves in a band. We wrote that song. It took quite a long time to write. And I think we were kind of a little bit concerned that the others would think, what the hell is this? bizarre thing that lasts for god knows how many minutes where's the rest of our stuff gonna go but as as an exercise in writing music and 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 creating something of that um, length i'm particularly proud of that we managed to actually do it that we have managed to actually write it and, and secondly that we managed to actually record it we figured out a way of doing it that, that, that made sense. Because normally, you know, in a rock band or anything, you, you have something that stays to the same speed and the same tempo and the same traditional structure all the way through. And you sit down and you record the basics and then you pile stuff on top of that. This was somewhat different. We had to figure out ways of breaking it down and assembling it uh, as far as I recall. But yeah, that that would be the song for me and that album would be the album for me probably because in 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 my experience i think people's songwriters and, and bands best output is when they don't quite know who they are yet yeah. if that makes any sense and yeah. this this was our second album and we were we were kind of getting to grips with the kind of music we were making but we didn't we hadn't quite formulated it yet. We didn't quite know what we were. And we were still in those early learning curves when we recorded sheet music. But there's, there's something about that album. And not every track is brilliant, but there's some, there's some really interesting stuff on there. And it, it shows a bunch of people who are still trying to find their way to something, I think. Whereas original soundtrack was a bit more polished um, and, and so on and so forth. It, it was just that sense of we hadn't quite made the grade yet and we were still searching for something, I think, on that album. How did is, the collaborative songwriting process work between you and Lowell in the beginning and how did it change over time? Well, we, we'd known each other for years. We, we, we were, I wouldn't say school friends, but we went to college together. We were all college together. Um, and when we met many, many years before that, under strange circumstances, I was trying to make a, an eight millimeter film of Dracula. I borrowed a camera and I was looking for someone to play Igor the Hunchback. Not that there was an Igor the Hunchback in Dracula, but what the hell. And somebody recommended Lol and introduced me to Lol. And he made a fantastic Igor. Um, but we, we got to know each other over the years, and he was a neighbour, more or less. He lived sort of a couple of hundred yards away. We shared lots of opinions about music and about art and film and the culture of the times. And we wanted to do things differently. And, and, and we didn't think like anybody else that we knew, so we became fast friends. This is before we were really in bands. And then, you know, I was in a couple of bands and Law was in another band. And we, the whole thing was one of those jigsaw puzzles that, that, that gradually came together. That's, that's, so when we found ourselves in a band that was having hit records, that was kind of a nice surprise really. But, but, but the, the relationship was still effectively the same. We were two mates who started writing music and ended up in this particular band. And did the penny drop about forming into 10CC only after acting as Neil Sedaka's uh, house band on his album? Is that yeah, really I mean, true? Yes, it is. Although before, well, before that, a few years before then, uh, myself, Lol and Eric Stewart were, had a band very briefly. We had one hit record called Hot Legs. We were 
a terrible name, um, but we had one hit record and we did two or three gigs supporting the Moody Blues. And that gradually drifted into us becoming the house band at Strawberry and the house producers at, at Strawberry. So from that point on for a few years, we saw ourselves as producers. Our main function with Neil was as a band. We would play, he was playing a very kind of stripped down kind of music, much in the same way as Carole King was at that time and having a lot of success. So we, we, were, we were performing as a band for him. And he just commented um, a couple of times about, why don't you guys think about forming your own band? And it's such a simple, obvious thing, but it never clicked because we were just fixed, mentally fixed in this idea of becoming producers, I think, at the time. But we thought, why not? Even though you had all had success in different ways? I don't think, Lo yeah, sort of. I mean, Lowell and I hadn't had a great deal of success, but, and Graham obviously had because he was a <laughs> successful songwriter. And Eric had been in the Mindbenders and Wayne Fontana in the Mindbenders. So uh, Eric and Graham had had reached way beyond Law and I's um, rate of success. We were we were the we were the rookies really at the beginning. Um, even after Hot Legs, which was a very brief tenure, it, we were just these two crazy kids who who felt like our job was to disrupt everything in a way and we did quite well at that i think evening thanks kevin thanks for coming on um Pleasure. i was going to ask how was it growing up in Prestwich as a young boy and what kind of music were you listening to i guess i was like any other kid growing up anywhere in manchester i was listening to you know what was popular I suppose, limited a bit to, to what I could listen on. My dad loved an opera singer called Gili, uh, as I recall. And, you know, the sort of popular music of the day, none of which particularly inspired me, but all of which sounded particularly brilliant when you went to a fairground and, and, and particularly early rock and roll would sound great on the waltzes and on the dodgems in those big echoey electrified spaces. Music sounded great coming from there. And gradually, you know, I was hanging out with people who played instruments, started to get into modern jazz at an early age. I was very fond of people like Thelonious Monk, Col Coltrane, uh, Cannonball Adelaide, Art Blakey and the Jazz Messengers, those kind of things. I think this is a bit later when I started going to art school and stuff and was I was mixing with other people who had slightly more refined musical taste than I did. Um, and I was getting into Nina Simone and, and all sorts of interesting people and some early blues records. And in Manchester in those early days, there were a hell of a lot of live clubs. It was a humming place for live music in Manchester when I was a teenager. There must have been about eight or nine live clubs where you could hear live music. There was a club called The Twisted Wheel, which had all-nighters, where you could go and listen to blues music. Blues players from the United States would come over. So you were surrounded by music. It was, it was incredible. And I don't know, I would, my, my taste in music was changing all the time, and it wasn't just rock and roll I was into. I was into all sorts of different kinds of music gradually. But I never really saw myself as a musician until, until kind of later. We were gradually found ourselves making music. I originally started off playing guitar and I was hopeless and graduated to drums, which I was quite good at. Um, and when we finally made it to college, art college, we had a lot more freedom and I found myself in the evenings playing gigs, going around the country in the back of a Thames van playing gigs and during the day being an art student, which was what I was supposed to be studying, graphic design with a view to having a, a career in graphic design, but playing shitty clubs at night was much more exciting. Just uh, just jumping in, Kevin. So you were saying, obviously, your, your kind of journey was there and what you were kind of listening to, was there like a, a song or an artist which sort of hit you and you went, right, that's kind of what I want to do? 
and that sort of influenced you sort of as a thread throughout your career? No, not really. Well, I, yes, it influenced me in that the music that, I think the music that we were all listening to at the time, music per se, popular music, rock music, had a vastly greater influence on people and the way they thought that, than it does now. Now it's part of a larger thing, a larger entertainment industry than for, for young people, I think. It, it actually meant something. There was something in the air in the 1960s that, that made you feel that you belonged to something special and there was something special happening. So everything, everything that was coming along, the jazz, the rock and roll, the stuff coming out of America, mainly American probably, and obviously what had happened with the Beatles and people like Bob Dylan and so on and so forth, they, all were, they were all bringing something new that was above and beyond the fodder we'd been fed before. Um, and I think it, it, it's, well, I, I mean, there are some amazing songs from the 50s and the 60s, but there was a sort of regularity about them and a commercial aspect to them that didn't allow things to change much. I mean, Elvis, when Elvis came along, it was, it was amazing, but he kind of, he kind of shoehorned the door open a bit. But when the Beatles came along, they, they knocked the door off its hinges and in such a way that everything could pour through. By that time, we were art students and we were very open to anything and everything in those days. So it had a big influence uh, on us as people. And, and obviously that was suggesting to us that maybe we could do this stuff too. Uh, Lon and I were in a cab with, I don't know whether it was with Eric or somebody, but a lot started chanting this thing. I have no idea why. And we kind of joined in and then we forgot all about it. But it actually came up again, completely off the cuff, in the very, very, very early days of Strawberry Studios, when they just kind of built the place in Stockport. And they got their first um, recording equipment in, which was like a four-track tape recorder and a small recording console. And Eric asked if Lola and myself would help him test the equipment. In other words, would we go in the studio while he mic'd up the drums and, and plugged things in and tried things and played uh, while he tested the capabilities of the new equipment, so, which is pretty much what we did. And one of the first things we did was record drums. I would go into the library and play. Um, and then he asked me to play again over the top of that recording and I play again. I do that maybe two or three times. So we had three or four tracks of drums and each time he would bounce them down to one track. He wanted to see what masked drums sounded like. But Lowell was sort of sat at my feet, maybe about four or five feet away from the bass drum, playing a guitar and he started singing this chant again that we discovered in this taxi ride. Uh, maybe a couple of years before. And so the recording you hear is essentially Lol singing into a bass drum mic while I'm playing drums. <laughs> that's, that's, that's how it began. And we had this weird thing, this primitive, bizarre recording. And uh, at some point, some big um, music guy came down from London to check out the studio. And we played him this thing and he thought it would be a hit record and so off we went for the night and we came back there was another session in after us and you know we were all very green at that time um so what happened is they used our master tape as an echo tape and wiped it the story could have ended right there but we learned something from doing it so we did it again essentially using very similar techniques, but just upgrading them slightly and recording the vocals properly, as opposed to into a bass drum mic. I mean, I was obsessed with the Beatles and Queen and 10cc when I was about 16 and 17, not the okay. most fashionable 
trio yeah. at the time. Queen, and even to some extent in the Beatles, you know, they were all writing, but as individuals, whereas the 10cc albums, it looked like speed dating for songwriters. Everybody was having a turn with everyone else. So I was interested yeah. in whether that was a conscious effort, like, you know, with, at some point, everybody's got to write with everybody. And if so, like, how did it, how, what did you do? Sit down with your date for that songwriting session or kind of come up with an idea yourself and try and find somebody who seemed appropriate or how did it all work? Well, no, it was, it was a conscious decision. I mean, I, I think we were always looking for ways to, to experiment and to see what happens if we do this and we do that. But there wasn't a huge amount of choice. I mean, I was, traditionally, there were two basic songwriting teams. It was me and Lola and there was Eric and Graham. That's how it kind of worked. But then, you know, there was only a, two other people I could write with that I hadn't written with before. <laughs> so we said, well, why don't I try this one with Lola? Why don't you try this one with Eric? It was strange, but it was a conscious decision. And we, I don't think we had any preconceived ideas about how it might work. We were prepared to chuck it away if nothing came out of it. But it was like an interesting thing to try. And the process was different to working with Eric as it was with Lowell, and it was different to working in Graham with Graham as it was with Eric, because everybody was, were different. There were different personalities and different tastes. You'd have to juggle yourself a little bit to sort of fit. And I imagine they were juggling themselves to fit with me. Uh, and it probably took a little bit longer than normal to get started because there wasn't a common language there immediately. Um, but we, we came up with some interesting things. I mean, it was it was an enjoyable thing to try. Um, I, but I, I, I think I maybe wrote two songs with Graham. Um, I don't know if I wrote more than one with, with Eric, but I, I, what it did do, it told us that we were capable of doing that. There was, a, you know, these, these hybrids were possible. We were kind of doing it to a degree anyway, because not all the songs were completed with two of us. Sometimes someone would come in and add a middle eight to it or suggest that we do this or we shift up a key. I, I kind of enjoyed it. And I think Life as a Minestrone was Lol and Eric, I can't recall who wrote which one. Graham and I wrote Iceberg. Um, Sacroiliac. Sacroiliac. Which I, right? I love. Um, but yeah, it, it produced some things. It produced some things and it worked. It kept the interest there, shall we say. How often would one of you get stuck and the other one would pitch in to, to add a middle eight or verse? Or All whatever? the time. All the time. <laughs> I mean, the business, the business of songwriting is... It's, um, it can be incredibly frustrating. You can work on something for two days, solid. And on the third day, when you play it, you think that's crap. And you junk it and you start all over again because it's just not any good. You've been fooling yourself for two days. If you write something and you can remember it the next day, then there's something worth continuing with. If you can write something you don't remember the next day, forget it. There are all sorts of stages of songwriting. It's more instinctive than it is about thought. It's not really about thought at all. And most of the lyrics you write when you're writing songs are gibberish. They're absolute. It's that. Mm -hmm. Because essentially, while you're writing a song, you're trying to write something and perform it while you're writing it as if it already exists. So to make it feel like it does uh, in some kind of way. But occasionally, as you go through the motions, some, some kind of magic happens. Sometimes magic happens. And somebody you're working with may hit the chord sequence and you may sing something along with the chord sequence that makes perfect sense for 20 seconds. And you it's a germ of an idea. Mm. And you hang on to that germ of an idea. And your job is to create the full disease that that germ starts. And it's sometimes it's really easy. It just takes you to places. Um, other times it doesn't, you know, it's it's it. But it's 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 enjoyable to do. That's why you play music. You don't work music. You play music. The thing about songwriting 
I've discovered over the years is you, particularly if you sit down and try and write a song, but you have no idea what the song is going to be. You are, whether you know it or not, you're looking for a key. And I don't mean the key of the song. I mean the key like a door key. Uh, the key to what you are going to write about. That was your first uh, UK number one. So how did you go about celebrating that? Uh, I was on holiday. I think we were all on holiday at the time. I think I was in, I'm not Jamaica, but somewhere like that. And everybody else was somewhere else. I had a glass of champagne. And <laughs> nothing too extravagant, as far as I recall. <laughs> it, was, it was amazing. I was hopeless at celebrating things. I remember when, when we had our first hit, there's Hot Legs. Lon and I went out and bought our first cars. Um, I, we both bought Lotus Plus 2Ss in white, blue, beautiful fiberglass things. And we were swanning around Manchester, you know, pop stars. Pulled into a garage to fill up with petrol and promptly locked myself out of my own car. <laughs> in the middle of a main street, this, you know, so-called pop star trying to get back into his car was, was taught me a lesson about that kind of stuff very quickly. Um, it was great. Having our first number one, number one record was was fantastic. It hadn't been that long since we started. So having having got that number one though, did you feel under pressure internally or externally to, to follow that up? Or? No, I, that's why that's why Strawberry uh, A as a studio and B where it was and where we were was so critical in, in our development as a band. Had we been in London, we would have had executives from the record labels popping around every 20 minutes to make sure that we sort of, everything's as cool as and, and as commercial as it could possibly be. Um, but no one did. We'd kind of, we kind of proved that whatever it was that made us do what we did, was capable of delivering hit records, they left us alone. Uh, that does happen. So in our particular world, the lunatics were running the asylum for as long as they could possibly get and give the record label hit records anyway. What would happen is we'd record stuff. Uh, and when we were ready, not them, we would ask them to come down and listen. And they did, and they very rarely made any comments at all. It was, it was great. It was marvellous. It couldn't have been better. Um, and I think that happens in all kinds of industries. It happens in film industry. It happens all over the place. If you are good and you pr prove that you are good and you sell stuff, they leave you to it. Presumably each band member had power of veto, did they? Was it quite a democratic process? Yeah. It, it, I mean, a lot of bands record a huge amount of material and then choose from that landfill of material what goes onto the album. We didn't do it like that. We, looking back, we sort of gave ourselves about three months to record an album. It usually worked out about that, maybe four. And we would work on a track till we all felt it sounded great and put it to one side. And we said, OK, well, we've got 11 more to do. And we go through the process until we had enough time to fill a 40 minute piece of vinyl and then we'd stop and that would be the album there wasn't well let's record three more and then we can swap them around and choose them we didn't do things that way there was no fat there was no there's no nothing in the vaults that didn't get used if some if we recorded something and it wasn't good enough um but we knew there was something in it we go back and do it again and that's that's what happened excuse me, with I'm not in love. Um, but no, we, we, we just kept going until we felt we had enough music for that record. It, it wasn't, it didn't work like other people do. Obviously a hugely important moment in the Beatles career is the day that they laid down their first album. They were given one day to record the first album. But I think you were given something, but they had the songs ready. You were given something just as challenging, which was to create your entire first album in a week, 
when you didn't have the songs and you did it and that album is so no. highly regarded no it was i think it was three weeks three Absolutely. weeks because we were we were ambitious we were full of it what have we got and off we went and every single thing that um talk about the beatles we were you know the beatles were our heroes okay so in our very early musical lives like many bands i suppose we were we were copying their style of music because they were our heroes and i think lots of people do that they love this band or they love the other band or some vocalist they sing like them and they play like them in the mistaken idea that if they sound like somebody else that is successful, they will be too. And I think we had with Hot Legs, that album was quite beatly because that to us was good music. When we had three weeks to make an album, there was no time to assess everything that we were doing. There was only time to do it. So everything that we did, we just did. And then we, recorded it and moved on to something next. So what obviously was happening, it was coming straight out of us and bypassing that sort of music critic part of ourselves that says it's, oh, it's not Beatly enough or whatever it was at the time. It's not Simon and Garfunkel enough. It's not Beach Boys enough. There was no filter. We were just putting stuff down as it came out, as we thought of it. And by the time we sort of finished the album, we realised that, that it didn't actually sound like anybody else. You know, there were influences in there, but it actually sounded like, well, we couldn't really put a name to it. It sounded like us. Was oh, Donna my... inspired by part, in, in part by O'Darling and Darling from Abbey Road? Donna was inspired by having half an hour to write it, I think, because mm -hmm. we, 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 there was another session in after us, I think, and we, we, we had to come up with something to get down as a B-side. So Laura and I went into another room and knocked this out in half an hour. And then we went in and recorded it very quickly. And again, it was like not, not much thought in it, but just, you know, Let's do something that's a bit of a pastiche thing of this period. I don't even think it was called do what then, but whatever it was, it was that. So we did it and it had a character, it had character. And did the phone actually go off during that 30 minutes that you had to write it? No. <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting if you think about our, our recording career, it began with a phone call from Donna and ended with a phone call on Don't Hang Up. That um, ring off on the end of uh, Don't Hang Up has made my mother cry. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> and I can see why. It's... Yeah, it's very poignant. Yeah. Yeah, it, it really worked. It, 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 it worked. It was uh, it's funny. You try these things, you don't know if they work. You think they work, but because you've done it, you don't really know until somebody reacts to it. And you saying that is... The way people react to your work is very strange. I remember a guy came up to me and said, I have to talk to you about I'm not in love. And I'm thinking, oh, God, I mean, what? He's, he's going to say, oh, it's how he met his girlfriend and they got married and all that. <laughs> he says, no, so my marriage broke up because of you. <laughs> Rob, I think you've got a question about a, a song that could have made it onto a... Beatles album? Yeah, in a way, maybe you've exploded this one by talking about how it's, you shouldn't be trying to sound like, but I was wondering whether there's a song of yours that you think if everybody's memory were erased and we could start again, could just slip onto a Beatles album and nobody would be any the wiser. The only one I can think of would be I'm Mandy Fly Me. There's something about it that reminded me of the stuff that George was writing at the time. Kevin, would you mind if I asked you about the drums? No, go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to ask you really about how you approached playing the drums in 10cc because um, I've never really heard you talking about that before. And it, when I listen to a lot of the old 10cc records, I'm always I'm always knocked out by how good the drums are. I mean, there's one track that always 
always knocks me off my feet, and that's blackmail, which right. is so it's so funky. And um, I'm a drummer myself, and you know, I spent years back in the day trying to work out some of the fills that you do in the really? you know, it, it, <laughs> in the breakdown sections. Just some really tasty stuff, really. And uh, with 10CC's music, some of the songs were so complex and almost orchestral you know things like one night in paris which i think has got has that got timpani in it or it, you know it sounds incredibly orchestral it's got all sorts in it yeah how did you approach the drums in 10cc i mean, I mean did you jam the parts into existence or did you write the song and then sit down with the guys and have a conversation with them as to okay what are the drums going to do in this song oh, how are we going to put them together it was much simpler than that we 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 would we go. We go into the studio and play it. We'd sit down and play, uh, and everything normally would just kind of fall into place. I tried to keep things as simple as I could. It was just a matter of doing something that fitted what was being played by the others. Because at that stage there was no vocals; it was purely a backing track. Nobody sang ever while we were playing. So I mean, I just no one's ever asked me this before <laughs> about playing the drums because I kind of forgotten that I did, but. Um, yeah. And you sang at the same time in some of the songs as well, which must have been a, yeah, oh, a nightmare. Yeah, it was. I saw, I saw myself as a as a songwriter and a singer, basically. Mm. Um, but I also played the drums. Initially, when I began in this world, I was a drummer, like everybody else. And I used to, you know, show up at lots of clubs and jam and get up and play with lots of different bands in Manchester at the time. But at some point... I found that I could sing, and at some point I found I could write, and that became more, more important. I'm pleased that you thought some of the things that I did as a drummer was good. Were good. I, I never really think of it in those terms. Interesting. Yeah. I'll listen to Blackmail again, see what I did that was so bloody good, but I can't remember it. Kevin, can I ask you about band dynamics a bit? Because uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but there doesn't seem to be too much acrimony between you and your former bandmates, which is great. And I wondered if it saddens you to see something like the the ongoing war between Roger Waters and David Gilmore in, in Pink Floyd, for example. Musicians, you know, musicians are nuts anyway, but I mean, sometimes they are sometimes they are pretentious nuts. And that's just it beggars belief <laughs> that this could have been going on for Yonks. I mean, I know there's, there's probably still a continuing thing between Paul Simon and Art Garfunkel, you know, just the two of them. Depending on your personality, being in a band is like a marriage. You know, you do become very close and you do get to know the people you're with probably more than anybody over maybe a short period of time. We were in the band, I was in the band for four years in 10 CC. We, you know, we traveled around the world and we were doing this, we were sharing bedrooms. We were... It was, there are obviously going to be times when you get on each other's tits, for want of a better expression, um, when you annoy each other and you don't agree about everything. It's as simple as that. But we it never got really to the stage where we're any, there were no punch ups. There was no, well, I'm not doing this, I'm walking out of the studio. There was none of that sort of diva stuff. We just, we weren't, we weren't rock stars. You have to understand that. We weren't rock stars. We were musicians. And we were there not to be rock stars. You know, we weren't Aerosmith. We, we didn't look like rock and roll stars and didn't really behave like rock and roll stars. We were musicians who were lucky enough to have a few hit records and we were lucky enough to enjoy what we did. And that is where it starts and ends, really. But yeah, of course there were disagreements. Always. Yeah. But what, what usually happens is you talk about it and something constructive comes out of it, one would hope. It got probably got hairiest just before recording uh, How Dare You, I think, because by then, 10CC Music had found a particular niche in the market. We were an ongoing concern. We had a road crew, you know, there were tours booked, people were anticipating an album coming out soon. And I remember distinctly, we had a meeting 
to discuss a pre-production meeting for one of a better title to discuss what we should be trying to write for this album it came down to where we want one of those you know we want a couple of funny songs when you one of your very long mad ones <laughs> and we want something a bit more romantic from you know it was like oh hang on it's like a shopping list is it <laughs> whereas whereas prior prior to that everything we'd done Right. As I said earlier, was in fact the result of what we managed to achieve in that period of time. That is it. That's what you get. There was no designing and calculating. Whereas suddenly there was. It was like, oh, we know who we are now. This is the checklist. <laughs> no. Didn't like that. Who, who was driving that? Was that the record company or? No, it was, I think no one was driving it. It was really, and looking back, it was quite sensible uh, in, in a way. But I think what had happened is Law and I were getting a little bit frustrated because we were the, being the disruptive element, the people who kept saying, no, that's really good, but let's screw it up and see what happens. Yeah. Approach, always. Um, it, it was a it was a safety net, I guess. We have to make sure we've got another album coming up. We have to make sure it's as good as the last one. We have to make sure it's this, that, and the other, in order to capitalize on where we are at the moment. We had a career, you know. We were a, a we were a going concern. Yeah. Uh, and it was in everybody's interests and our own uh, to make sure we continued as a going concern and a successful going concern at that. But we were getting a little bored, honest, to be honest with you. And, and that was just another example of a situation that was like, oh, we've we really got to have to write another mad long one. Can't we write 30, 10 second ones instead? <laughs> you know, why not? There that, that sense of, experimentation have been tried to be dialed down a bit you know so any 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 sort of annoyances and stuff like that were mostly about uh, how we worked how we wanted to work how we were going to continue to work and stuff kevin you mentioned not uh, not being rock stars yeah did you ever think to yourself, is there something we could do visually with the band in order to maybe go off in a slightly different direction? Because it's quite ironic because, you know, you and Lol went on to be such multimedia leaders in a way, and yet 10CC seemed to miss a trick maybe at some point down the line, just in terms of not having a visual hook or, or not using... I totally agree with you. I 100% agree with you. And in retrospect, I've looked back and thought exactly the same. Mm -hmm. um, at the time, we just weren't interested. It, we left it to other people who made a hash of it every time we played a gig and Queen were supporting us, okay? And they went on first with the biggest fucking light show and the biggest sound system anyone had ever had and blew us off the stage before we set foot on it. Um, and it was embarrassing. We had an on and off switch. You know, they had a light show. It was embarrassing. But we didn't have the interest. There was no interest there from anybody. We didn't, A, we didn't have a style. You know, if you think of um, any of our, any groups that were working in a similar vein to us, Roxy Music would come to mind at a similar time a very strong visual ethic as well, uh, and a very strong aesthetic and approach, uh, as well as their the great music, as well as the band. We did not have that. I mean, I was getting interested in clothes because I was hanging out with a lot of fashion people in London at the time. So I was beginning to understand what dressing meant, what dressing could help, but I was the only one. No one else gave a shit. Um, and it's it is sad because had we have applied our visual sensibilities to coming up with something for the band, we could have done it in a way. I mean, Floyd did it. As a band, they didn't look particularly inspiring, but what they applied 
to their music certainly made a huge difference. They had a huge visual component to what they did, but they still look like shit. You know, I mean, we, could have, <laughs> we, we could have done something like that, but maybe the budgets weren't there and nobody really knew what it would take. And we were so engrossed in, in the actual music itself that we didn't bother.